Welcome back to our third lesson this morning. Certainly have had a great morning studying the second chapter of the book of Ephesians. We're going to finish this chapter with our next lesson. The next lesson is how Gentiles became fellow citizens. The text will be Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 through 22. Our speaker will be Brother David Brown. Uh, David Brown has been a preacher for many years. I've known him for um, all of my preaching life. Uh, in fact, I studied with David at the Southwest School of Bible Studies in Austin, Texas, way back in the dark ages, and uh, appreciate everything I learned from him and those that were at the school at that time. Uh, it's sad that I cannot recommend that school anymore. But uh, that is the way of the world as it influences the church. David is one of the elders at the Spring Church of Christ. He also is their full-time preacher. And we appreciate the good work that he's done there over the many years. <clears throat> David will be guiding our study. And I'm going to turn the microphone over to David. Come preach to us. Thank you, Bruce. I appreciate your kind introduction. And oftentimes when we get a chance to be around one another, we confess that we are appreciative of each other. And the more life goes on and the more inroads the world makes on the church, how much more so we do appreciate those who stand fast in the faith. Bruce is one of those in this congregation. Her elders and members, we deeply appreciate. We certainly continue to covet your prayers. We appreciate the spring congregation and pray that together we're in our respective areas we will serve the Lord faithfully and be a candlestick holding up the light of the gospel for all the world to see with a willingness to contend for the faith fight the fight of faith no matter the sacrifices that we must make I'm especially thankful to be able to be here today because this day is special for several reasons you know it wasn't long ago we had Mother's Day well that was on the Lord's Day but we have a Mother's Day and that's fine but today here I am uh, my wife and I a few brethren and on May 27th, 1959, I was baptized into Christ. Then on May 27th, 1971, Joanne and I were married in Pinson, Tennessee. And so we've got a, a good celebration of things here with the brethren and fellowship with the Lord, and worship, the study of His Word. How much longer we'll walk this old earth, I don't know. Nobody does, young or old. But for those of us who have gone past 70 years old and a little longer than that, we know things can't be that much longer. So we do what we can while we can with what we have to do with. And then when I say that, I realize that's what I've been doing anyway all my life. So what's the difference? I ask you to look with me now to Ephesians 2, and we will zero in just a moment on verses 11 through 22. Thus far this morning, we've looked at how Paul pointed out to those brethren in the city of Ephesus in Asia that they had been raised and seated on a throne, as it were, verses 1 through 10. You notice that he will say, verses 1 through 3, how we've studied that our condition outside of Christ was we were dead in trespasses and sins. That we were walking according to the course of this world, verse 2. Verse 3, we were fulfilling the desires of the flesh and mind by nature, children of wrath. And I do want to comment on that. By nature here doesn't mean that we, as Calvinists say, have inherited Adam's original sin. 
It means they practice it for so many generations, we would call it it's second nature to them. They don't think anything about the wickedness they're in because they've been doing it so long. But then we see we're made alive together with Christ. That's the next section, 4 through 10, which we studied. We're alive in Christ. We're outside of Christ. We're dead or separated. That's all die, death, or dead means, separated from God. Thus, we're in a lost condition. But as we studied so well this last time, we see it's by virtue of his mercy and his great love that our minds can't fathom that he has made us alive together with Christ. Even when we were dead in those trespasses and sins, Thus, as John Will talked about, his favor we cannot merit and do not deserve was extended to us. Even while we were yet sinners, as John pointed out, Christ died for us. Thus, he's made a situation where we can sit with him in heavenly places. I wish we had time to even go back over that, though we've studied it. It's a sermon, it's a study in itself. Because God has something in store for us after this age is over, after material things cease, after the judgment and after in a glorified resurrected body, we're in heaven with him that in ages to come, God might show the exceeding riches of his grace. In ages to come. Now on this earth, we talk about the patriarchal age, we talk about the mosaical age, we talk about the Christian age, which we're now in. Well, there's three ages but he talks about ages to come following material things and time and space. Don't know what all that means, but it means as it goes on and on in eternity without end, what does God have in store for us? We're proving ourselves and developing our character in the likeness of Christ even now because God knows that's going to fit us for the things he has for those that love him in ages to come. What work will we do? What does he have planned? That's an amazing thing. So that kindles my uh, interest to a great extent. We've seen how we're saved, as John well pointed out, grace through faith, an obedient faith, 8 and 9, in Hebrews 5, verse 9. He's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That these things are out of ourselves, we didn't develop our own plan of salvation, or no man did. But God gave it to us on their terms of receiving that gift. I used an example not long ago in a study I was having, uh, trying to show that grace can have uh, terms that one must meet to enjoy what is freely given to us and we don't deserve. I actually said, now, if you're up there in Huntsville, and yet you know and have full confidence in me that I can do this, and I tell you that I'm going to give you a million dollars if you get down here in the next four hours, uh, and, and you know that uh, you, you don't even deserve it, you don't know why I'm giving it to you, but you know I'm going to do it. You have full confidence I am. I said, how long would it take you to get here? You better hope you're within four hour drive. Well, that's right. But that was the stipulation. So you would be immediately, and I said, don't you understand then what it means now is the day of salvation and today's accepted time. Get up and act. Well, you wouldn't be deserving it because you made that drive down here and received it because you can't use it. No matter how much you trust me to have it, give it to me. You can't use it till you appropriate it, till you receive it. And there's something involved in receiving the gift you don't deserve and can't merit. John well pointed that out. So it's not a work that any man should boast. So we're thus God's workmanship. Everything we do uh, when it comes to obedience to God is a passive thing. Passive how? We're obeying God. That's how God's work is done. I'm God's work's being done now as I preach the Word. As we sing these songs of praise. As we do all those things that Christians are to do in being faithful, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Whose work? Work of the Lord. Who does it? The Lord's church. Thus, it's a passive thing. I submit to His will to do things His way, the way He wants it, for the reasons or reasons He wants it, and I'm fully obedient. But whose work's done? His work. 
His work. Even faith is a work of God, Jesus says. When I believe the truth of God that proves the deity of Christ and I brought to belief or faith or trust or confidence in Him, that's God's work. Now, because it took my cooperation with Him in submitting my will to Him, that makes no difference. It's still God's work. How did I know I must believe? Except God told me. Jesus said to the Jews of his day, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. That's something they had to do, or die in their sins. So we see then, we come to my part in this, that we were created to walk in good works which God prepared beforehand. That's where John ended. When we do all those things God lays upon the church, the spiritual body of Christ to do, and the various members and our talents and abilities are put to work, According to the authority of Christ, who's the head of that singular body of the church, the family of God, then God's work is done on earth. When we preach the gospel, it's God's work being done, and so on and so forth. But now notice how that brings us up then. And uh, I don't know why Bruce uh, gave 10 verses to two speakers, and I get 11 all the way through 22. I guess that means I get to speak longer. <laughs> It doesn't. I know better than that. But anyway, I laid the groundwork here, and here I, here's why I laid the groundwork. Look at how verse 11 begins. Wherefore, remember. Wherefore means, did you hear what I just said, and did you understand what it meant to you who are members of the church in Ephesus, and how you got to where you were, and God's part in it, and your response to it? Well, Paul will say to the Philippians that they ought to forget those things which are behind. And here he says, remember. Well, we found a contradiction. No, there are some things you forget and there are some things you need to remember. Memory is an amazing thing. We take our memory with us, and our mind is not just the brain. The rich man in the Hadean world was told by Abraham, son, remember. He's completely out of material world, time, and space, but he still has his mind. Right here, we're to remember what? Well, remember that we're talking about how the Gentiles became fellow citizens. You must keep in mind the state of affairs that existed at that time and had for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. If you don't watch out, you'll read these books written to Christians and most of the New Testament's written to Christians to keep them faithful, individuals and churches. And you'll think of these people being converted out of Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterians and Roman Catholics, or even they weren't a member of a particular church. That's the only background they had. And you'll think they all came out of that kind of thing. But they didn't. You will never find in the New Testament a debate or debates or discussions on whether one ought to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins or not. It's not there. Because that wasn't the battleground. They understood that if you really believe that all that belief means in Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that kind of belief and trust automatically meant you're going to do what He says. And you're going to cease doing that which is contrary to what he says. They understood that. So you never find somebody being told to be baptized and saying, well, what about the thief on the cross? You don't find that. That comes along because of denominationalism, Protestant Reformation for the last virtually 500 years. And if we don't watch out, we think those people back there in the first century in the Roman Empire were coming out of the same background religiously as most of us did. If I were to ask you today in, in most uh, churches of Christ, those especially that are still trying 
to do what Jesus authorizes. What's your background? When you were baptized, what religious background did you have? What, could, what knowledge, maybe very shallow, but what knowledge of religion did you have? I promise you most of it would be connected some way with some denomination to some extent or the other. And you would already believe in God and Christ and the Bible and have some concept of those things. Twisted and confused and corrupted though it may be. Doesn't mean you're living by it, but that's your background. That's not the case with the people who were the Gentiles in the first century. What is a Gentile? A non-Jew? Now, the whole empire of Rome was mostly Gentiles. Jews just were a little drop in the bucket. And they isolated themselves from the Gentiles. They, if you please, and pardon the pun, looked down their nose at the Gentiles. And they thought, we're so good. Now, look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You'll see how Jesus dealt with that. And you can see that it showed up rather early because when you read the book of Jonah, he didn't want to go preach to those people for fear they would repent and God would forgive them. And they were the people who would destroy the ten northern tribes, the Assyrians. But they don't have any background like we have. What kind of background did these people have when he says, Wherefore remember that ye in time past were Gentiles in the flesh? Read Romans 1. And that will tell you the kind of mess they were in. No concept of God as you have it from the Bible. No idea of a Christ. No concept of anything to do with the gospel. No proper understanding of life after death. They believed in it at all. Just look at the Egyptians who preceded long the Romans and the Greeks as far as their time and power on earth. What did... What did they think of the gods? And look at what they did concerning the afterlife. You couldn't be any more pagan if we even understand what that means today. So why does he say, you people who are now members of the church, you Gentiles coming out of that kind of background, remember, folks, it's good to remember the mess we used to be in, if for nothing else to measure how far we've come in knowledge and practice of the truth. If you go through the New Testament, you'll see that kind of thing brought out in various places. But you'll see the impetus many times is belief in Christ, following Christ, adhering to His will, turning not to the left or the right hand, the straight and narrow way of truth as it is in Christ. And that meant turning loose originally where the church started among the Jews of all that stuff, but very quickly it would be out of the Gentile thing. You see, when Paul wrote this roughly around 62, there's just a few years left for there to be a nation called Israel, for there to be a temple and a Sanhedrin and a, and a place that he knew. Because it's all going to be gone in about eight years or thereabouts. And after that point, then it's not the Jews that have such a power in the church because that's where it started. But the Gentiles come in and they're already doing it. They come in by the droves. So much so that finally in a few years the Roman Empire says, well, this is obviously not connected with the Jews, a sect of the Jews. But it's something that stands on its own two feet. It's something that's far greater than that. And here's why. It's words like this. Inspired words writing part of the New Testament. Paul wrote this and made it very clear. Here is where you used to be. What put you where you now are? And all you got to do is go back and remember what you've already heard preached this morning. It was a cooperation between them and God. God, God by His grace supplied for them 
the power to be saved. Now, what is that? Well, that's the reason it's good to go back to Romans 1.16 because right after he describes that debauched mess they had gotten him into because they gave up God, and thus he gave them up and they turned into the immoral, amoral, corrupt characters that they were, that Paul immediately says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And that's the Gentiles. So he says, remember. Now we probably have more than I think you're aware of. We may have said it in earlier studies of Ephesians. But we have more in the Bible about the church at Ephesus than we do about any other church. You go back to Acts 19, you have a thorough study of getting the church, starting with 12 men and then going forward. Paul stayed there about two years teaching in the school of Tyrannus. And so it said all Asia, because of his teaching, heard the word. What does it mean? They all had the opportunity to hear the gospel. Isn't that amazing? Because of his teaching, everybody in Asia, and that's a Roman province. Romans would read all the lines for their provinces. There always was an Asia. It's Turkey today. But they would withdraw it to suit themselves. So the gospel, because of Paul's work, had gone out to all these non-Jews. What kind of people were they? Now I want you to think about this when it comes to us trying to find candidates for Bible study. Somebody that would really be convertible. The Gentiles in general of the first century, you would never approach to try to study the Bible with them. They are a corrupt bunch. But that's the kind of people that Paul's talking about that heard the gospel. You've got this brought out when you study in the Corinthian epistle. I think that's very interesting. Corinth fits pretty well to be a pretty good pattern for the time of immorality that existed because it was considered to be uh, further down the drain <laughs> than a lot of the other places. In fact, even... They would say, if you were called to be, having been Corinthianized, you were worse than most. Now listen to what the brethren were, some of them, before they heard the gospel. You'll see some of these folks in Ephesus. He says in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 6, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, talking about homosexuals, abusers of themselves, mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. Now you say, well, that's bad people. Maybe they've got all these up here in some of these places around Huntsville or someplace. And no, that's the way they live throughout the empire in general because they didn't have the moral background that Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterians and all have had in the past. They didn't know anything about anything like that. And such were some of you. I sometimes think in our opposition to the trans people and the homosexuals that we almost get the idea that if we were to start to study somebody and they say, well, you know, we're homosexuals, say, well, I can't study you. <laughs> what we're seeing here, brethren, when he says, you remember what you were when the gospel came to you is the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not by accident that God caused His Son to come into the world at the time that He did, the place that He did, and caused the church to be established and for it to go out in the world in that first century. That was the time when the world needed it most. And it had this power within a hundred years to just bowl over thousands of people in the sense of converting them to Jesus Christ. We must be careful lest we think that, well, these folks, they, they, they wouldn't hear the gospel. But in getting these people to grow and to develop and to appreciate more of what we already heard preached this morning, he says, you need to remember. You need to remember what you used to be and where you now are. Notice in time past, Gentiles, the flesh... And then he talks about who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made with hands. Well, that just refers again to the, the pride, puffed up attitude the Jew had. And he's really making a play on words. 
the Jews would talk about the uncircumcision. That would be uh, uh, almost a byword to the Jew that you'd have anything to do with the uncircumcised people. Well, Paul turns it around on them and says, well, you know, they're the ones that are called the circumcision. You're so proud of being distancing yourself and nothing to do with the uncircumcision. You're talking about circumcision made with hands. That's significant. Made with hands. They forgot that Abraham never was under the law and that he received the sign of circumcision because he had already been faithful and obedient. They just had the idea, and it would be very much true, the Judaizing teachers who said to the Gentiles, you can be saved, but you must be circumcised after the manner of Moses. Paul is basically saying to them they got everything all messed up. They think just being circumcised is enough. But they forgot that circumcision was a sign of in-depth faithful obedience and dedication to God, which they did not have. So notice, it's the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. It's not of the heart. The gospel was aimed at the heart. God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was then delivered to you, and being then made free from sin, ye became the servants, the doulos, the bond servants of righteousness. You made yourselves slaves to Jesus Christ because you knew in Him was your only hope. And you learned that through the teaching of the truth. Notice what He does. He emphasizes it further in verse 12, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. There's your Bible study candidates right there. There's the people that the gospel was designed to turn around the other way. Think about it just for a moment. When you go back to the development of the scheme of redemption down through the ages, it starts off with promises, very vague, meant probably more clear to us because of our other knowledge of the Bible, it would have been even to Adam, Genesis 3.15. Then you come down, it becomes a little brighter when Paul then, or rather uh, to Abraham, God said that through thy seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And you come on down, that's renewed twice more. Gradually is unfolding. But then you come to the giving of the law in Exodus 19 and 20 to Moses for Israel on Mount Sinai. And I cite you Deuteronomy 5 verses 1 through 5 to point out that law was given to the Jews was not given to be preached to the whole world. Now, some Gentiles could choose to embrace it, thus we have proselytes. And the Jew viewed them different because they elected to take that upon themselves. And you have, going down to the Old Testament, different ones who were not descendants of Abraham through Jacob, thus born a Jew, but yet they were taken in because they willed. I've thought many times how we play this at weddings sometime having to do with someone going with somebody else. Someone's God being their God. Someone's people being their people. Well, that was Ruth the Moabite. She wasn't apart by genetics from Abraham by Jacob. She wasn't a Jew, but she was taken in. Why? Because she elected to take upon herself those things. But when you look at this particular matter here, the Gentile, the uncircumcised Gentile, these things were never said to him. Now, as my understanding, the patriarchy continued for the Gentiles, and that's what they had but the great great majority of those people did just what you read of Romans 1 so at the time the gospel came they they didn't they didn't know anything they had nothing 
They were without God in the world. It couldn't be said better. Having no hope without God in the world. There's your, there's your candidate for the gospel. Well, notice what he does. But now, at the time he wrote that letter, at that present time in the first century, to the people to whom he wrote it, what about them now in the church at Ephesus? Now in Christ. And that's already been referred to the usage of in Christ. The book starts out that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are located somewhere where in Christ. I think you'll find that the word in, not always referring to being in Christ, is used probably over 50 times in the book. Most of the time it's referring to in Christ. But in Christ, Jesus, you who sometimes are far off are made near by the blood of Christ. Now to me, this sums up what this whole section's about. How did these Gentiles become fellow citizens in the kingdom of God? The blood of Christ. Well, what did Paul say in the beginning of Romans? The gospel's the power of God to save. But what's the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15 pertains to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And there wouldn't have been any salvation save Christ died on the cross. What was the purpose of his death? To shed his blood. But what was the purpose of giving his life? Life's in the blood of the shedding of his blood. There had to be a reason behind it. Well, Acts 20 and 28 tells us that he purchased the church with his blood. We're taught that when we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his death. That's where he shed his blood, Romans 6, 3 and 4. We see then that he goes ahead to say, and we have to look to Galatians 3 and verse 26 and 7, where by faith we're baptized into Christ. We're baptized into his death. And we have the blood of Christ continuing to cleanse us from all sin as we're faithful to God. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, 1 John 1 and verse 7. For he's our peace who hath made both one that broken down the middle wall of partition. That old law set up a barrier between Gentile and Jew. Now that's all destroyed. First of all, the barrier destroyed between the people and God through their belief and obedience to the gospel. And thus we're in fellowship with everybody who's also heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel. And that put Jew and Gentile together in one, one body. Well, that's what he's going to say over in Ephesians 4. That there's one body, not uh, division. And, and let me say this, and we'll be through here in a minute. We often pray for peace on earth. There'll never be peace on earth like we would like. Never will be. Because the true peace that's going to come on this earth is individuals who embrace the truth, who obey it, and who live, as the Bible said. There's true unity. There's true oneness. That's what Paul's saying here. How did you Jews and Gentiles become one? You all heard, believed, and obeyed the same gospel. You added to the church by the same Lord. There's how you're one. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. Notice what happens. Slain the enmity or hate thereby. How did you cease to hate one another? Spurn one another? Treat one another as if they were second, third, fourth class citizens. Why, you heard and believe the same gospel. Same Savior saved you. You look to the same God to guide you. You're in his kingdom. You're in his body, the church. And came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. Preach peace. How do we preach peace to people today? Well, we declare the doctrine of the United Nations. Or how to be a good American or a good somebody in the West. No, no, you preach peace to people when you preach the gospel. You do no violence to the scriptures to say, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to peace among men. Because this is the way God will have it, and it won't work unless it works according to God's plan. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Notice both, Jew and Gentile. Now, therefore, whoops, there's one of those go back and reason with what I've said and come to a conclusion. Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Remember what Paul said to Timothy? But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, 
the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15. And notice what that means then, you Gentiles who've heard the gospel and are one with the Jews and they with you through the same God and His love and grace and the same Lord and the same plan of salvation where you're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. You know, we forget what a cornerstone does and then the lesson is going to be yours. A cornerstone makes everything line up. And the house of God is built on that corner. Christ is the cornerstone of the house of God. That puts everything in its proper perspective. So we close out in whom all the building. That's why that comes there, Christ being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly framed together. What does it do? Growth into a holy temple in the Lord. Now here's where we learn the church, the family of God, the kingdom of Christ, the body of Christ is also a temple. It's a place of worship. And so, in whom you also are built it together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. If you'll listen to the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. If you'll understand the truth of the gospel. If you'll obey it, as we've studied already this morning, in believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, you'll have the fellowship with God, and you'll have the fellowship with everybody else that's done the same thing. And to keep that fellowship, then we walk according to the authority of Christ. And whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Colossians 3.17 Thus, if you want to remember some things, remember what you used to be and know what God has made you through your humble reception and obedience to the truth. And then you can forget those things which are behind. And that means even past successes that he talks about in Philippians. And you can press on to the mark, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you. Great lesson. Appreciate David bringing that to us this morning. Two peoples brought together in Christ by the same gospel. First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. This lesson reminds me of that text. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Apostle Paul there is saying... That if he could be saved, anybody could. And we don't get to pick and choose who we preach the gospel to. David made a good point when he said those people that are the most wretched among us, Jesus died for them too. And we don't get to say, you're not worthy of the gospel. You know how sometimes people will say things without saying things, but if you listen good, you can really read between the lines and you're not judging you're just understanding. Well, there was a man that I knew, member of the church. I'm not going to say faithful. But through conversations over the time I was with that congregation in Little Rock, I had perceived that he was prejudiced and that he was homophobic in the true sense of the word. A lot of times if we oppose homosexuality, they just say, well, you're homophobic. But this guy really was. And so I asked him one time, I said, would you preach the gospel to a black man? He said, no. My follow-up question, would you teach the gospel to a homosexual? He said, no. That's just arrogance gone to seed. That's all that is. The Jews thought they were better than the Gentiles. Romans 1 and Romans 2, but they weren't. They were all condemned by sin, and they were all in, in need of salvation from the Savior. It's our job as the church to carry the soul-saving gospel message to the lost, regardless of who they are or what they've done. I'm glad somebody brought the gospel to me in my house. And I'm obligated, I'm like Paul, I'm debtor to preach the gospel because Christ died for me. And somebody brought the gospel to me. We're going to stand adjourned uh, till 1.30.
We're going to get a break. We're going to have lunch prepared. We're going to dismiss in just a minute after a prayer. The ladies are going to go and uh, make the final preparations. And then we're going to say, start your engines and go. And <laughs> we can make our way back there and have lunch. I hope everybody will stay, not only for lunch, but for our afternoon session. We have a couple of more lessons and a question and answer service. We're going to cover chapter three after lunch. So after a word of prayer, we'll be dismissed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before thee this morning. We're thankful for the great lessons we've had from the book of Ephesians. We're thankful for the men that have presented those lessons and the, the time they've taken to put those lessons together and develop them and present them here this morning. We're especially thankful for those who are present in our assembly to listen to these lessons and to study these great messages from this great book. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for the food that's been prepared. We ask thy blessings upon it. We're thankful for those that contributed to the preparation of that meal. We pray, Heavenly Father, that it would nourish us, that we might have strength to continue our service. We're mindful of those that are less fortunate that we need, and we pray that we'll put their needs before our own. We're thankful for all that you do for us every day, the blessing we have in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.